everyone, it's Serena. Welcome to another session of the Algorithmic Inclusion Stream at ACE. I organize events like this once a month to highlight research that mitigates systemic bias present in machine learning applications. Head over to our website at ai.science to create a free account, view the slides for this talk, and check out everything else we have going on at ACE. Um, so, hi everyone, my name is Melvin. Um, I work in Google Research. Um, specifically on the Google Translate team. I've been at Google for about five years now. And all of the five years I've been working on Google Translate on the research side of Google Translate. So today I'm gonna to talk about the work that we've been doing on how do we handle gender bias in Google Translate. Um, so let's get started. So we, we all know there are lots of um, uh, concerns with uh, AI and machine learning, especially when it comes to bias and different kinds of biases, right? Uh, we've seen the articles in the press about uh, bots being racist, about algorithms being racist, voice recognition being sexist. Um, of course, translation is also very much included in these examples, right? So here you have an article from Fast Company from 2015, which talks about Google Translate's gender bias problem and also some of the other translation engines like Bing and Sistran, for instance, right? And this is specifically the problem that Serena mentioned earlier is uh, because we learn from data that's out there, we make associations like doctors are men and teachers are women um, and things like that. And um, here is an example of uh, Google Translate actually. So, uh, Specifically, the first example, if you look at it, it's trying to translate from Turkish to English. So Turkish is actually a gender neutral language. And what that means is they don't have a pronoun for he and she. They actually have the same pronoun that could either mean he or she. So the pronoun O here actually refers to either he, she, or it, and it depends on the context, right? So when, when someone's typing in Ober Emsir, uh, it could either mean he is a nurse or she is the nurse, but we pick the translation, um, she is a nurse. And when someone's typing in Ober doctor, it could either mean he or she is a doctor, but we pick he is a doctor, right? So we're making that association that doctors are masculine and nurses are feminine. If you look at the example at the bottom, you're translating from English to Spanish. So now we know that in English, these words like doctor and secretary, they're not gendered, right? Whereas when you go into Spanish, these words are actually gendered. So when you say, I talked to my doctor and you translate it into Spanish, Google Translate actually picks the male doctor. And when you say, I talked to my secretary and you translate it into Spanish, Google Translate picks the female secretary, right? Again, we're making an explicit association here. So how do we address this problem, right? So when it comes to gender, what's the right gender bias in translation? What's the right thing to do? So if we have some ambiguous gender in the source sentence, that must be resolved for linguistic reasons, right? Because it's ambiguous in the language that we're trying to translate from, what should we do, right? We have a few options. Let the training data vote. Um, this is the current behavior and it's not satisfactory because we know that our training data is biased. And for instance, when we did an analysis on our training data, we found that the training data has three times more masculine data than feminine data. And also we know that the training data itself tends to make these societal uh, assumptions about certain occupations being related to certain genders, for instance, right? Um, can we adopt gender neutral variants? Um, so we've thought about this option and one of the downsides of doing this is um, many of our users actually consume Google Translate who don't fully understand English uh, for instance, or don't have a perfect understanding of the language that they're translating into. So they might be easily confused when we're saying they are a doctor or they went to the market. Um, so we need to figure out what's the right um, user experience to surface this. Uh, the other option is to flip a coin. Uh, this is much harder than it sounds because even if you flip a coin and you randomly pick between a masculine and a feminine translation each time, uh, to certain users at a certain point in time, it might still come off as biased. For instance, if I am looking at the translation and we decided to flip a coin and you pick the feminine one and then we flip a coin again and we pick the masculine one, you're still not removing the fact that you, you're biased. 
Um, so I think the right thing to do is, where possible, we have to change the task. So instead of the task being a single sentence input to a single sentence output, we want to offer multiple answers, if possible, with explanations. We want to give users more control by letting them either choose the options they want or tell us that they don't like the option that they're seeing. And this is what we did. So in uh, December of 2018, we actually launched uh, this feature where when we detect uh, a gender ambiguous source sentence, we actually provide both the masculine and a feminine translation instead of picking one translation that, that might be biased. Um, so we wrote up a blog post about our approach, how we went about it. And what we launched was actually uh, for single words, we basically, what we did was uh, we could look up a dictionary of masculine and feminine translations, and we would show both the masculine and feminine. For example, if you typed in nurse and you wanted to translate it into Spanish, you can get both the masculine and the feminine words for nurse, right? So this is easy because you just have to in ingest the dictionary, make sure you have both the masculine and the feminine variants, and then um, surface them. But how do we deal with sentence level support for um, this kind of phenomena, right? So first, um, for example, in this Turkish to English example, you have to detect that Ober doctor is ambiguous. Then you have to have a way of generating both the masculine and the feminine translation. Um, so this was much more involved. And the way we did it was actually by using a three-step approach. So what we did initially was uh, we had a classifier that tries to detect when the source sentence is ambiguous. Um, so once we know that the source sentence is ambiguous, we try to generate both masculine and feminine translations for that ambiguous source sentence. And for generating translations, we use these um, models that are called sequence to sequence models. Um, they are similar to um, these very popular BERT models that you've heard of. It's a transformer encoder or an RNN or an LSTM encoder, and they have a decoder. So the encoder encodes some text, and the decoder produces some translation, right? So we need to change this sequence to sequence model to be able to produce both the masculine and a feminine translation. And then finally, we want to check actually that these translations are valid. And what, what I mean by that is uh, for a sentence like Obir doctor, you generate a masculine translation that's he is a doctor and you generate a feminine translation that she is a doctor. Now you want to check that these two translations are the same except for gender. Um, for instance, we don't want to show pairs, whereas one is saying he is a doctor and she is not a doctor. These are not equal and they're not parallel. So we, we do this final check where we try to make sure that they're aligned and the only thing that changes between them is gender. And since we launched in December 2018, we've actually expanded this feature to one of our biggest languages. So Spanish going into English is one of our highest traffic languages one of the most popular directions. And so now when you type in English, my friend is a doctor, we show you both the masculine and the feminine variants of, of doctor. Before we would just pick the masculine variant of doctor. And we did the same approach here. So we had to build a classifier in English to detect when the English was ambiguous. We changed the underlying, the machine translation system to produce both masculine and feminine variants. And we had this validation step. Um, so while we were doing this, it took us a while to move from doing Turkish to English to doing um, English to Spanish, for instance. We realized that there were a bunch of issues with this approach. Um, one, there were quality issues. So what we did was um, we were generating these masculine and feminine translations from the model independently. Um, so what that means is... Uh, we would first generate a masculine translation, and then independent of the masculine translation, we would in parallel generate a feminine translation. And what happened most often was the model produced um, translations that were not exactly parallel. So sometimes um, these mistakes are pretty innocent. So it will say something like, uh, he is smart and she is beautiful. And this is not exactly parallel, but maybe it's OK if we show it to users. Uh, but we decided not to show these because we wanted to be pretty conservative with what um, kinds of masculine and feminine translations that we showed, right? So what happened then was 
because of the strict criteria that we had, we could only show, we could only have a recall of about 60%. So what, what that means is of all possible times that we could have shown these two translations, we only end up showing these two translations about 60% of the time. And that's because the two translations tend not to be the same. We also ran into scalability issues. So one was that uh, building a classifier to detect this ambiguity on the source, it was data intensive. So we needed to collect uh, lots of data where someone labeled these examples as saying, this is ambiguous, this is not ambiguous, this is ambiguous, this is not ambiguous. So that's data intensive. And it's also tricky. So when you think about it, if you have a sentence like, my friend is a doctor, depending on the language that you want to translate into, the doctor can be ambiguous or not ambiguous. So if you're translating into Spanish, we know that Spanish has gender for doctor. So that's an issue there. But if you're translating into Tamil, for instance, there's no gender for doctor. So it's not ambiguous in that case, right? So it's a, it's a little bit of a tricky problem to actually build this classifier. The other thing was uh, it increased our maintenance cost for maintaining the translation model. So what we did was we changed the underlying translation model to actually enable it to produce both the masculine and these feminine translations. So when we ask it to produce a masculine translation, it's able to do so. When we ask it to produce a feminine translation, it's able to do so. And then when we ask it to do translation in the default model, it, it's able to do so independent of the gender, right? So when you want to refresh this model, you actually have to change, refresh the gender component of the model. You have to refresh the default component of the model. So that makes it really hard to maintain and scale. So what we did recently um, was actually to think of this problem as a rewriting problem. So what I'm going to talk about next is rewriting based uh, generation of these gender specific translations. So there's a blog post at the bottom if you want to know more. Um, but um, here's our previous approach, right? So originally what we did was we were trying to detect these gender neutral queries. We were trying to generate these gender specific translations using the translation model. We would check for accuracy. But with the new approach, what we do is we first generate a default translation. And if the default translation is gendered, then we try to rewrite that default translation into an alternative um, so we can show multiple gender translation. And finally, we do the same, same step of checking for accuracy. Um, so how do we build this sentence level rewriting system, right? So we, we need data. So we need data that goes from masculine to feminine and feminine to masculine uh, sentences, right? So what we did, we started with some monolingual data we programmatically generated these gendered alternatives. So um, you have this table here as an example. I spoke to her. We try to find all possible substitutions for her. Then it becomes I spoke to him, I spoke to his. Uh, these are the expansions. But we know from the context that the right one is I spoke to him, right? The same thing. The pen is his. It can expand to the pen is his or the pen is hers. What we know from this, for this particular sentence, the right one is the pen is hers. Um, so how do we do the candidate um, selection? We basically break this tie by using an in-house language model. So a language model essentially assigns a probability to a piece of text, and we pick the piece of text that has the higher probability of occurring. So once we have the data, we have lots of masculine and feminine translation pairs. We merge both of these data sets so we, by using a task tag. So we take the masculine to feminine data, and we add a two feminine tag in front of it. And we take the feminine to masculine data, and we add a two masculine tag in front of it. And we basically merge these two data sources and train a sequence to sequence model. Right. So our sequence to sequence model is essentially a single layer transformer um, with uh, one attention head. And we essentially train the simple single layer model because we believe that this rewriting problem is a much simpler problem compared to translation. Um, so this um, single layer model is optimized for latency. For instance, when we serve these models on TPU for just doing the rewriting, uh, the latency is about five milliseconds. We also found, initially, we found some issues with uh, the model being sensitive to casing and punctuation. So we introduced some noising in terms of adding casing and punctuation variants in the data for better robustness of the model. 
So finally, uh, once we have a model, how do we evaluate it, right? Um, so for doing the evaluation, uh, we came up with a new metric to track our progress. We call it the bias reduction metric. Um, so we define bias reduction as the relative reduction in bias between the current system and the new system. And we define bias as whenever there is an ambiguous source, if you're picking a gender when you are supposed to be showing multiple options, then that's defined as a biased event, right? So when someone says Ober doctor, instead of showing two translations, you are showing one translation. So that's a biased event. So we basically define bias reduction as what percentage of queries is the current system biased for, what percentage of queries is the new system biased for, and how much did we reduce that bias by? So using our new rewriter approach, we actually get high quality gender specific translations. So for the previously launched Turkish to English system, we increased the bias reduction from 60%. As I was telling you, we had quality issues uh, to about 95%. So what this means is we reduce the bias of the existing system. We reduce 95% of that bias um, and we're biased for only 5% um, queries of queries. Um, we also launched this feature for other gender neutral languages. So when you go from Hungarian to English, we have a bias reduction of about 94%. When you go from Finnish to English, we show you gender specific translations, again, bias reduction of about 94%. Persian to English, we have a reduction of about 90%. And when we do decide to show these gender specific translations, we have pretty high precision. So uh, we're not wrong when we show when we decided to, to show two translations. Um, so 97% of the time, when we trigger these multiple translations, we're right. Um, so when someone's saying it is an apple, we will not say he is an apple or she is an apple. That would be wrong, right? So we we aim to have a pretty high precision there. Um, so this is about what we've already done. What we're working on now is how do we also handle um, gender in documents, for instance, going beyond sentences, right? So here is uh, the Wikipedia article for Marie Curie. Um, I took the Spanish article and I translated it into English using Google Translate. And as you can see, about 16 of the 20 pronouns in the article are actually wrong. They're masculine. But we know that this article is about Marie Curie, right? So we're currently working on how can we best handle gender in documents and also other document level phenomena. That's all I had. So if you have any questions, uh, you can reach me at melvinj at google.com. And I'm open to questions from Serena now. Hey, it's Serena again. I hope you enjoyed the session. You can view the full video discussion on our YouTube channel. Make sure to give this video a like and subscribe to get notified about all the exciting future sessions we have coming up. I'll be back in a few weeks with another algorithmic inclusion event, so stay tuned. And if you have ideas on what you would like to be presented or you would like to present yourself, leave a comment here on YouTube or send me an email at srina at AI.science. See you soon.